I'm just going to interrupt real quickly to remind folks that if you have questions, them after our final two presenters, Roy Williams. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Roy Williams. I'm president and CEO of the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce, and I'm not an economist. Uh, <laughs> and it's rather intimidating to have five of them precede you, and then you follow them and and and, and make some comments. Um, the I do not have a PowerPoint either, so at least I have something in common with one of the economists. Uh, the question that was posed to me uh, and the thing that I was asked to address is what really matters for economic development? And, and, and very simply put, economic development is nothing more than primary job creation. So, so it really what really matters for job creation? Uh, in the uh, bio that's in there about me, uh, it tells you quite a bit about me. But one thing it doesn't tell you about me is that in the consulting business that I owned, uh, one of the things we did was we were corporate site location consultants. We were hired by Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, our company was, to help them find the right location for either relocating their corporate headquarters or their manufacturing facilities or their distribution or where, warehouse or back office or whatever. Uh, so in that capacity, uh, I really understood and found out why the C-suite, why the corporate executives really do put jobs wherever it is they do put jobs. And if you combine that with the national research that's done every year, what you sort of find over the last 30, 40, 50 years that people have been kind of tracking this, none of that ever changes. Uh, there are about three factors that drive why companies end up going where they're going. The only thing that has changed is that one of them has become uh, much more important today than what the others were. So when you survey the corporate community and you sort of ask them, when you began your process of figuring out where were you going to put these primary jobs, about a third of them used to tell you, well, it was because we were driven by access to markets, and so that's why we went where we did. Another third would tell you we had to have access to resources, natural resources or another supplier or something like that. That drove where we went. And the other third would tell you we had to have access to a certain kind of talent. And so that's why we went where we went. The big change that's occurred over the last 10 to 20 years is now about two thirds of them are driven by talent and about a, only a sixth by market access and a sixth by resource access. So the, the critical thing we think about a whole lot is talent, uh, the ability to have talent, to grow talent and to attract talent. Uh, so once you get past that level, and, and people often refer to this process as a site selection process, it's really not a selection process, it's an elimination process. Uh, companies starting out, start out this process looking at everything, and then they find reasons to take places off. And uh, there's a multitude of things that do that, but in essence what happens is you look at a whole bunch of places, you say, I'm not going to go here, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, and finally you end up with what is called the least worst place, the best place. Uh, and that's where they end up siting their facilities. So once they get past that first factor, uh, then the second factor kind of kicks in, and that's kind of the relative competitiveness of the regions that are still being considered by being in the game. And, and the things that then get evaluated are things like annual operating costs, which include taxes, utilities, labor, transportation, public policy, incentives, et cetera. And, and then what you find, too, is that companies never do go to the cheapest location. Uh, they go to the place where they believe they get the best value for what it is they invest in and the cost that they pay. Uh, they want good infrastructure. They need highways, roads, airports, ports utility infrastructure, communication infrastructure, so they can get their raw materials in or get their services and products out. Uh, so that is a huge factor that goes into the competitiveness of a region. Another, this has been mentioned, is good education facilities. Because when they go to a place, they have to rely on the talent that is there and are the talent they can recruit into there. And they know that to keep the talent that is there or to recruit the talent in, it's got to be a place where people want to live, uh, where people perceive they have a good quality of life uh, and that 
those attributes will help them in their in their efforts of, of growing that talent. Uh, I'm going to give back some time too, but the final comment I want to make is is again, it's not a reason to to raise or lower taxes or anything like that, uh, but rather the impact of messing with the state uh, personal income tax has an impact to us in the economic development uh, business that very few people think about. Uh, I happened to have been in Oklahoma one time before my current time, and it was back in the late 80s and early 90s. And in the early 90s, when Governor David Walters was governor, and I was at the Department of Commerce, he tasked the Department of Commerce to come up with the best incentive program in the U.S. And I'm proud to say we did. Uh, and it got passed by the legislature in 1993. It's called the Quality Jobs Act. And it is lauded nationally as being one of the best incentive uh, plans that any state has ever put into place. Um, the issue, though, about this is it is solely funded by the personal income tax. That is what it is tied to. Uh, so any incremental decrease in the personal income tax or, or the elimination of it has the exact same impact on that incentive. So a partial uh, reduction partially reduces that total, totally eliminates it. I wouldn't say that's a reason that you don't want to mess with personal income tax, but it is one of those things that be careful what you do without really understanding. It, it's, it you know, could be considered an unintended consequence. And to us in, this, in the economic development business, that's a huge consequence. Uh, and I'm a little frustrated because we have met with leadership in the House and in the Senate, both sides of the aisle, and I don't think anyone is paying one bit of attention to this. Uh, no one has come up with, okay, if we do this, how do we fix this? How do we solve this? Uh, and it presents a significant competitive issue to Oklahoma. Uh, so I don't have the answer either. But if, if we're going to go down this road or some other road, I think we have to make sure that we don't look at just a couple of outputs that could occur, but what are all of the unintended consequences that could, because it could have a significant impact uh, on this state's ability to attract quality jobs to Oklahoma. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Justin McLaughlin, and I'm Vice President of Economic Development with the Tulsa Metro Chamber. And I'm speaking, as Roy Williams is, as an economic developer and somebody that's on the ground every day to try to recruit new jobs to the northeast region of Tulsa and to try to uh, create expansion opportunities as well. We represent 22 public sector entities in northeast Oklahoma with the Tulsa Metro Chamber in our new um, five-year fundraising campaign. Um, this is a general economic development definition, and basically what it talks about is the main goal is improving the well-being of a community through efforts that entail job creation, job retention, tax base enhancements, and quality of life. As an economic developer, I would generally say I consider economic development to be creating primary jobs for communities. And by primary jobs, I mean jobs in my community that would be American Airlines that are bringing outside dollars in, um, not necessarily retail jobs. Um, every year, there are about 1,500 projects nationwide that are being chased by about 15,000 economic development organizations. Um, so the competition out there is very fierce you know, in the business that we play in. Um, and going through this process a little bit, many times uh, we have a lot of data that's on our website, and many times we are screened out by site location consultants or corporate real estate executives before we've even, we even know we're on the list. They look at our websites, and so they do an initial screening. After the initial screening, um, say they like our area, they like the Tulsa region, they will give us a request for proposal. This includes very detailed information that they were requesting on the sites, on demographics, on tax rates, you name it. Um, sometimes these things can be 160 pages long, and they're very detailed. Um, assuming we pass that next, uh, the next step, the company will decide they would like to come out for a site visit. Um, this can take the form of multiple site visits um, in, community lo in company locations, um, and then after that, a location decision will be made. 
Um, every year, there is a, um, a trade publication that I actually have sitting here, if anybody's interested. It's called Area Development Magazine. And every year, they survey corporations, uh, decision makers, and they survey separately site location consultants to find out what are the biggest things that are important to them when they're making decisions. And as Roy talked about, these factors don't significantly change from year to year. But I'll go over a couple of these. There's actually 25 that are in the, that are in the, the magazine. I only posted 10, uh, 15 of them just for the purpose of brevity. Highways is, is, comes up as being the number one. They have to have accessibility. Um, labor cost is always a factor. You see many companies that are looking to um, decrease their costs and are moving out of high cost areas, so labor cost is one of those. Corporate tax rate is something that can be a factor. Um, and then number six, local and state incentives. Um, and let me speak to incentives very briefly. I don't like incentives any more than anybody else, but every, every state has incentives. Most every state, communities have incentives. And so in order to be competitive, we have to have those um, from my standpoint. So that's something that definitely is, um, is important, but it's not something that um, we always like. Um, and and I, one thing I'll note about this list, this is actually the, the list for corporations they're looking. Um, within the top 25, the personal income tax rate is not listed as a factor. Um, on this list. The next list that I'll, I'll show you is what the, is the survey of the site location consultants. Site location consultants work on behalf of many different companies, and so they really are a big target that we focus a lot of our energy on, making sure that we know them. Um, skilled labor is important. Um, land is number five. Many times we can be eliminated simply because a building that we have just doesn't work. They move on to the next community, so building is something that we're very focused on. Um, supplier proximity at number 12, that's something that um, we just were talking about an auto supplier search recently, and they had to be within 300 mile radius of BMW in South Carolina. So a lot of times suppliers drive those as well. Um, I will also point out to you again, within the top 25 site location consultant factors in the survey, uh, personal income tax is not listed within that top 25. Now to talk a little bit about my experience, um, what do I see as we're looking to recruit companies? These are the kind of the general factors in no particular order that we see as being important. Um, a challenge is always skilled labor. Um, we hear from, for the, from Oklahoma as well as other states that it's always difficult to find skilled labor. Um, we're hearing that in places like Denver and places like Houston, um, that really the, the war for talent is becoming stronger and stronger. And so we're something that we're very focused on and trying to recruit workforce to the region. And I think the state has been very focused on that as well. Um, available sites, like I talked about many times, we are eliminated. Um, and then we talked about state and local incentives. That is a checkbox on many of the proposals. I would say many of them, 99% of them probably, um, have a checkbox. What are your state and local incentives? Explain. And that is many times an eliminator. If you say, we don't have a local incentive, that can be an eliminator. If you don't have a state incentive, that can be an eliminator and then move on to the next state. Rail access, many times having a site that's located on rail is important, um, and then training. And I, I would submit to you, I think what a really big driver that I don't know that anybody is looking at is having direct flights is a huge issue for corporations. And I think that has been maybe one of the major drivers for the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You, you can actually get people on a plane, get them back in a day, and I think that's a huge challenge for the state of Oklahoma that I think we really need to look at. But I think direct flights and, and actually direct international flights as well. Um, I was in Dusseldorf last week um, with a state delegation uh, representing the state and representing the Tulsa region. And we heard from a lot of German companies that Atlanta is really on their radar screen because Atlanta has direct flights from Germany, but many other communities are not. So it's kind of, it was kind of interesting to hear that. I'm going to read for you a quote. Um, one of the top site selection firms in the nation that many of you may be familiar with is McCollum Sweeney Consulting. And I asked uh, Jeff Forsyth recently a question, basically, and I asked him about how big of a, of a factor does um, a personal income tax play in economic development. I'll read you kind of what he wrote to me. McCollum Sweeney has assisted numerous clients with strategic location decisions, and I cannot recall a project that heavily weighed a low personal income tax environment. It's nice to see a state that is trying to be proactive with their tax policy to encourage business attraction, but I would recommend the state concentrate their creative thinking to reduce the company's tax burden. In recent years, several states have been modifying their corporate income tax apportionment formula to the benefit of industries they are targeting. 
this may be something that Oklahoma should consider. And that was from a site consulting firm that I would consider to be the premier one in the United States. Um, Roy talked a little bit about quality jobs program. Let me explain, if, uh, if for those of you that may not be familiar with the Oklahoma Quality Jobs Program, the Quality Jobs Program essentially rebates back to a company that has certain wage thresholds. Um, it's about $30,000 per year, a little over $30,000 per year. They have to be in certain qualifying industries. Um, they can receive up to 5% cash back for a period of 10 years on those new jobs. That is funded by the income tax solely. Um, and to me, that is one of the biggest benefits that we have to give to a company. Um, it's, it, it seems like in the incentive game, it's never enough for companies. But I will tell you, I think without that quality jobs incentive, um, we would be in, in significant trouble here in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and these are other incentives that would also be, I believe, would also be impacted possibly um, if the state income tax were to be reduced. But I can tell you, um, quality jobs going away is something that keeps me up at night. Um, I think so far the legislature has been supportive of it, but it's something that is very, very important to what I do and to recruiting jobs. Um, when you can sit before a company and say that your benefit is X million dollars over 10 years if you create these jobs, um, it's, it's really an, a good thing to be able to have for that. The other thing I really like about it is, it is a, it's a pay-as-you-go program. If you don't create the jobs, you don't get the incentive. So it doesn't matter, so they don't get a big check at the beginning and then don't, or at the, at the beginning of the project then don't create the jobs, they never get paid if they don't meet the, pro meet the criteria. So I think that's one thing that I really like about the program and it's very well, it's, it's administered very well by the Department of Commerce. Um, I think there was actually a, re a journal record article in the paper yesterday, I believe, on quality jobs that really talked about the impact. They said that, um, I think it was Deidre that was actually quoted in there, 610 companies participated, 16.67 uh, billion dollars in payroll from those companies, um, and 2011 average wages for companies in the quality jobs program are 62,571 uh, per year, which are, are excellent wages. I think we could all agree. Um, with that, I want to thank David Blatt and Oklahoma Policy Institute, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you today from the economic developer standpoint. Thank you. This is not karaoke. <laughs> oh, pardon me, he wants to sit. Uh-huh. There's a tenth question or two. Do you want to maybe move the chairs up some so you have a longer from sitting there? Oh, we have to stagger them. <laughs> oh, that would be... No, we only do. Okay, I've got a quite a few questions and we have about 30 minutes, so we will we'll get as far as we can. By the way, panelists, I thought you did a great job. <laughs> Lex, you too. <laughs> Actually, as a, as a young undergraduate at the University of Oklahoma, I had the pleasure of getting to listen to Lex pontificate for a whole semester on macroeconomics, and it was, it was one of the best, best classes I've ever had. Um, the, the first question, Lex, I'm actually going to ask for you because this is uh, maybe in a sort of a budgetary context. You know, one of the things that we did in the last eight years that I was least proud of was the trigger mechanism we put in place that, you know, as we saw this year and when you needed it the least, it kicked in because things started picking up a little bit. Well, what we're hearing from the legislature today is more of this, let's do these triggers and every time we get a little bit of growth, then we'll, we'll cut taxes. Can, I didn't hear anybody speak to that concept. Could you talk to that? <clears throat> Um, what, what he's describing is a situation where if uh, the, you can write it any way you want, but uh, in gross production tax, for example, if the price of oil goes 
above such and such, then the gross production tax will uh, change to something else. If it goes below, I've forgotten what it was. $30 a barrel is fond memories. Uh, <laughs> then the gross production tax will go down. Uh, the problem with trigger mechanisms um, is that they're typically one directional ratchets. And so if you, uh, if you reduce it because of the growth, then if the growth is not sustained, and remember the very important distinction you made about growth versus value, growth is compounding. And so if the growth isn't sustained and, it, and the growth rate declines, then you're not going to get it back again because of the one directional ratchet of the situation. Tabers have been written that same way, where you end up where if uh, you, your economy uh, grows. Least I need to remind you here, the <laughs> gross production tax and Oklahoma has a relatively volatile tax. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know why it is that I seem to be the only person that remembers 1974, 1982, 1986, 1989, and I'll probably be remembering 2014. And this is the way it's going to go when you're tied to uh, some type of a, of a um, resource-based economy. I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I can go make my fortune by fleecing the fools in North Dakota that are now building motels that'll be empty in three years, uh, like we had in all of Western Oklahoma for a while. So what you have then is the, the um, triggers as you're talking about, when you have a volatile tax base, then you're going to end up with these ratchet down, ratchet down, ratchet down, and you can never go back. Again, if you get it wrong, you can't fix it. Okay, great answer, Lex. Um, I did have somebody ask if there are any legislatures and present members of the legislature present in the audience. Now, I did see Joe Dorman. Anybody else? There's a couple of y'all in here. Yeah, we have we have several in here. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, thank, thank, thank you all for your. Section 23. Scott, we've got Emily Burgess Norman, our newest representative, Curtis McDaniel, just elected about five weeks ago to the House. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Joe. Now, this one is maybe more of a statement than a question, but I, I just got to read it to you, and I'll admit the name. Um, other than billionaires like name a minute, who puts hundreds of millions of dollars in hidden packs to reduce government, what prominent Oklahomans are pushing the no Oklahoma income tax policy? Um, let, me, let me just say, there are people that are pushing it. The Oklahoma Council for Public Affairs has, has taken the, the lead on that. That group was formed, they get mad when I say this, but it's really true. They were formed by an individual who was, his, his mission in life was to eliminate the uh, state's income tax. They do have a broader mandate than that. But, but they are certainly at the forefront of that. And, and let me just say, it's great retail politics for politicians because nobody likes to pay income taxes. And it's always good to go out and say, I want to cut your taxes because it appeals to people's personal sense of greed. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where it comes from. Um, now, this, this next question I thought was a really great question. Because I think you've heard a little bit of mention, really the key driver of our economy in Oklahoma is the energy industry. And, and natural gas is king. And this question is, if natural gas prices do not increase over the next year, how will this impact current budget project projections in addition to a possible income tax cut? Does anybody want to take that on? Who's on budget? Well, I mean, what's it going to do? Well, and, and part of the deal is you've got a budget that is built on certain yeah. level of, of gas prices. What's going to happen? Yeah, aren't we already seeing that? Yeah. Uh, yeah in revenues. Yeah, uh, if you notice, there was, you, you may have not have noticed, there was a report, and I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, by uh, Ken Miller, who it was the first revenue decrease in 24 months in Oklahoma, and he attributed it to the low price of natural gas. It's finally starting to show up in our in our budget numbers. So. Obviously, that's important to, to the economy. Um, this, yes. Uh, I noticed in Tulsa, candidate Gingrich said that he wanted to get $2.50 gasoline. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. And some fool in Tulsa actually thought that was a good idea for Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but, and by the way, in Oklahoma, we're for higher prices of gas. <laughs> it's good for us, okay? The, the extent of my projection would be based on my experience roughnecking. I actually roughnecked in Wyoming from 1980 to 1987. And there's a bumper sticker that's probably faded out now. It says, please, Lord, let there, not, let there be another boom in the oil patch. I promise not to piss it all away this time. <laughs> Yeah. I know you did. <laughs> the, uh, the, there, and this may have to be a technical question dealing with one of the reports. It says it's sort of a two part. How can you have a report that predicts job growth that exceeds population growth and unemployment? <laughs> number one. And number two, why wouldn't you eliminate spending before the revenue? Anybody want to take that on? I. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, it, it's relatively easy to get growth in the labor force that exceeds growth in the populations and increase in the labor force participation rate. We saw dramatic evidence of that in the 60s and the 70s with the Women's Liberation Movement and the Civil Rights Act when more, a larger share of the population entered the labor, the formal labor force, which is where we count it. So that part um, isn't really a problem. At this point in time, what we're seeing is slight declines in the labor force participation rate. That's over the last two years, largely associated with the recession. Um, what was the second part of that? Um, why wouldn't you just cut? Um, I don't know. Oh, yeah, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, I ceded two minutes a minute ago. I'm going to back here. Uh, I, I think that if the uh, if the goal of this proposal is to spur economic growth by reducing the personal income tax, uh, our two uh, members from the development world have put the lie to the premise to that proposal. It is not that. My view is. Uh, that this is designed to shrink the size of government, but it's not doing it in what I consider to be an intellectually honest way. If you, and I'm willing to debate what's the proper size of government. Uh, if one believes that the government is, quote, too large, then the intellectually honest way to do it, the way that makes some sense uh, is to decide which particular uh, policies, which particular proposals don't meet the standards that were designed for those particular agencies, proposals, or policies. Put it up to a vote and get rid of it. That requires, however, thinking, analysis, and some type of will to do that. The easy way is you just starve the whole beast, and then the result of that is as uh, we and Scott will affirm, if you're trying to balance a budget where you don't have enough money, you end up with no real centers of quality and excellence. Everybody gets to be mediocre. And that, to me, is really the premise that lies behind this particular proposal. Not that I've actually been told that by anybody. Scott, I've got one comment. Um, I keep thinking, probably idealistically, that we could make some progress in this respect if, if every time there was a major tax change, up or down, proposed, um, we identify at that time as part of the proposal how we're going to pay for it. Um, and I think if we could do that, especially in this instance, uh, it'd be very enlightening. Because what this is is a proposal to cut taxes and absolutely no proposal on how you're going to handle the spending side. I, I got some of the, the let's, let's kind of follow that up. I, I, I like that thought. Let's follow it up, though, for, for a moment, and let's sort of have a little bit of an academic discussion. We've got some of the brightest academic minds in the state, certainly when it comes to economics. And it seems to me that if you cut my taxes, that all of the benefit of that tax cut will not inure to the state of Oklahoma. For example, I might put some money in my uh, in an investment account. Uh, my kid that's going to school in Utah is always wanting more money. I might give him some money. I might, I might go online and buy something. Whereas that spending that I was going to cut 
by law, 100% of that occurs within the state of Oklahoma. So as economists, do we get more bang for our buck by spending it responsibly here in Oklahoma or by giving a same amount of a tax cut out that we don't necessarily get all the benefit in Oklahoma? Oh, that's an easy one. We teach in basic principles of economics that there's, that there's a bigger multiplier effect from the expenditure change than there is from the tax change. And um, uh, I don't know, to economists, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, that, okay, that doesn't necessarily apply to the Oklahoma legislature, so let me just say. <laughs> I, I, I want to kind of digress a little bit, go back to the previous statement. I had the opportunity in 2002 to spend two months living and working in Kiev, Ukraine, which had a very small government, both city, state, very, very small. It wasn't much of a player. Um, and I got mugged my first day there. Um, cop was watching me. Apparently, I didn't have enough money to pay both the mugger and the cop. <laughs> Um, their economy was dead to the world, it was going nowhere, so this idea you get rid of government, you're going to have a healthy economy is simply not true. What you're going to have is a lot of armed camps. While I was there, our DCM was assassinated, as was his daughter. That's how life is without a government. That's kind of an uplifting comment. <laughs> the, uh, let, let's switch our attention now to the sales tax, because some of the discussion has been, you know, you ought to do like Florida, you ought to do, you know, a broadening of the base, um, and sort of two questions related to sales tax. Question number one, a member of the audience wants to know, you know, what does the academic literature say if you raise your income tax, do you force more sales to go online then? I mean, is that, is there an elasticity there? You mean the sales tax? Yeah, sales tax. Did I say sales tax? I meant sales tax. I'm like, you know, like I said, I don't know what I'm saying half the time. So, so there is some um, literature out there about trying to predict. Online sales are hard to predict because it's anonymous and you don't really know where people live. You know their IP address. So um, I know the Department of Commerce, the U.S., uh, tries to track this and there is evidence of people escaping taxes by going online. So certainly that happens. I don't have a good number of how much that impact is in Oklahoma, um, but certainly you would see that if you raise the sales taxes. You know, you do it, I do it, we all do it. More people would do it more often um, if there was more of a task to escape by shopping online. Okay, the, another sort of related question is, if we broaden the sales tax base, who ends up paying that and what does that end up doing to our economy? Well, if we were to broaden it, uh, most of the proposals are to increase, the, to levy sales tax on services. We only tax about 40% now of, of uh, consumer expenditures. What's, what's left out are, are services. And um, I, think the, I think, frankly, the evidence is kind of mixed. Um, you, you can identify services that are pur purchased largely by lower income households, but there's a whole host of services that are purchased by higher income households. And unless somebody here has some information on who's going to pay that sales tax on services, um, maybe we can't answer it. Uh, in 1986, <laughs> <laughs> a proposal was put forward to the legislature to balance the budget by increasing the sales tax base and reducing the sales tax rate, okay? Um, it went nowhere, actually it went nowhere very slowly. Uh, <laughs> the, the problem is that when you start to look at what those services are, some of them are pretty straightforward. Why don't we pay a sales tax on uh, dry cleaning services? Why don't we pay a sales tax on uh, auto repair services? But services also includes things like tuition at universities. Uh, the one where they really finally caught me was, you mean to tell me you're going to charge sales tax for coffins at the funeral service? <laughs> it's like, oops. Uh, <laughs> medical services. The big, huge categories are those areas where we start to wonder whether or not we should be doing that kind of thing. But uh, the general economist's answer to uh, taxes is, broad base, low rate. That's always our answer. So when, the, when you look at who pays sales tax in Oklahoma, when you look at the, the reports yeah. and the composition, 
what you see is that business is the as a as a sector is the biggest payor of sales tax yeah. in Oklahoma. I, I would submit that if you increase the base, business is probably then going to bear a disproportionate share of that. Most of the proposals that I see are to eliminate taxation on business, business purchases of goods and services and to broaden the base on consumer purchases. Um, currently, um, the biggest burden falls on low-income households outside of the business sector. Uh, now, whether when you broaden the base, that would be likely to be true, I'm not sure. Okay. By the way, that, that brings up a point. One of you, did someone have another comment on that? Okay. Um, what, one of the problems with any of this who actually pays is there's what I teach in my intro classes is, is the legal versus the economic incidents. So you get people who claim that uh, illegal immigrants don't t pay property taxes because they don't buy houses. Well, they do rent houses. Guess what the landlord put in there? He put in property tax costs. So when businesses say they pay the tax, that's the legal incidence. That's not necessarily the economic incidence of the tax. Could well have been paid largely by consumers of the business product. Okay, good question. Now, by the way, one of the one of the charts, and I don't remember who had it up, but it made the point that if you if we eliminated the exemptions and, and whatnot, that proposal that actually the the poorest segment of our population their taxes would go up. I mean, what does this look like for those most at risk in our state if we if we eliminate the income tax? Well, well, I, that was I put the figure up, but it wasn't my figure. <laughs> um, definitely. So we're talking about not cutting all the income. Uh, at least the initial cuts would be top, the top rate. So think about which households fall in the top income tax rate. And the figure I put up was from uh, ITEP, and um, they suggested that 60% of the households, the lowest 60% and lowest incomes, um, would incur actual tax increases because they no longer can take exemptions that lowered their taxable income. And so definitely there would be a shifting of who pays the tax, particularly if the cut from the tax rate is borne by the lower income households. So I know we weren't talking about equity issues um, a lot with questions. the personal income tax changes, but there's, you know, we could all talk for hours on that. Now, I, I, I've probably heard this from David at some point in time, but it seems to me that the, I've heard the sales tax is more aggressive and then it's disproportionately paid by lower income Oklahomans. Is that correct? I'm seeing a lot of people nodding their heads. Yeah. Okay. The a another question is the uh, there was some discussion earlier about the factors that drive economic performance in, in an economy, and there was some talk about tax rates. And I heard capital investment mentioned. I remember reading an article once that that uh, talked about the level of educational attainment of your population being the biggest correlation between between. Um, economic performance of a state. Can you tell us, I mean, from your all's professional work, what are the key drivers of economic performance in a state? Would you define in, economic in performance? Oh, okay, I know I was going to get some, I know I was gonna get some <laughs> economist deal back at me. Okay, let's talk about growth in personal income per capita. Let's talk about, let's talk about those types. Of, I think the studies I looked at we're typically looking at personal income growth and or uh, state GDP growth. I'll take a crack. I'm, my colleagues up here may disagree, um, but I think Deidre will agree. Um, what drives the income? People's wages. So if you want to think about what's going to drive growth in personal income, you think about people's wages and earnings. And I would say labor force enhancement, better quality workers, people better train to get better jobs. And I'd say that's what drives growth. Uh, and I'm talking about growth for people in the state, not new jobs that mostly go to people that weren't here to begin with. Uh, only one partial thing to add that it also includes physical capital that the people have to work with. It's about the productivity of labor that's associated with capital. It's associated with human capital development. And as states go, Oklahoma is wildly underperforming on that basis. Slight addendum to Justin. Um, I, I was just reading a paper 
today, because I read hundreds of papers, right? Um, and it was saying that infrastructure, bridges, roads is necessary but not sufficient. So you can have the bridges and the roads, but if you don't have the people, you're not going to get the businesses. I, I think we're all studying the same economics, yeah. <laughs> I uh, have a, had a question. I didn't fully understand. It's 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 asking about North Dakota, and a question about what uh, North Dakota maybe has a state bank. What part does the North Dakota State Bank contribute to their growth? <laughs> I'm I'm not familiar with that. Does Does anyone know what that has to do with? It's one of the dumb things that I know about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Among many, right? <laughs> North Dakota is a very curious state. Uh, they're mostly uh, Finns and Danes up there. Uh, you read Rolvog. And uh, the state bank is actually, if you want to find socialism or communism, <laughs> go to North Dakota because they have a state bank. They don't have other banks there. And it acts like a regular bank bank. Okay, well, it's I'm not, opposed to that. I want to be on I record thought that you today might. saying that I'm opposed to that idea. The, uh, but I think we would probably all agree that North Dakota's excellent performance has more to do with something called the Balkan, which is the richest oil area yes. in the country. And, That's right. And right. the low base. Yeah, yeah, and a low base. Yeah, no, but their, well, their, their state bank acts like a regular bank. Well, with okay? that, let me, leave, let me, let me let, leave you with this one last rhetorical question. Um, and this, this person wanted to know, basically it's a compound question, how is this train going to be stopped and who is going to be the adult in the room? I'll leave that to the audience to figure that one out. Thank you very much. Let's give, let's give a huge hand to all the panelists who did a great job and I think if we... Having now actually succeeded in keeping seven economists to 12 minutes each, I'm gonna go home and convince my son to eat vegetables. I think anything is, anything is possible. Um, I wanna thank all of you for coming.